Giuseppe Mazzotta is Sterling Professor of Humanities for Italian and, the, and Department Chair of Italian Studies at Yale University. His scholarly interests focus mainly on medieval and Renaissance thought, although over the course of Professor Mazzotta's distinguished career, he has published widely on all periods of Italian literature. His significant contributions to the study of early modernity have shaped the field for current and future scholars in Italian studies and beyond. Professor Mazzotta is a prolific writer and has published several books, including Dante, Poet of the Desert, History and Allegory in the Divine Comedy, The World at Play in Boccaccio's Decameron, Dante's Vision in the Circle of Knowledge, The Worlds of Petrarch, and The New Map of the World, The Poetic Philosophy of Giambattista Vico. Recent editorial work includes the Norton edition of, of Dante's Inferno, he has also served as the president of the Dante Society of America. Lately, Professor Matsota's lectures have gone viral. Over the past year, his open Yale course, Dante in Translation, has achieved wide success and has introduced a new platform for engaging with students and scholars on Dante's work. I encourage you all to revisit Dante through this new and, and exciting lens. We are very grateful to Professor Matsota for joining us this evening, and would like to also thank sponsors, faculty, students, and Professor Matsota for participating in this conference. Thank you all for coming. Please join me in welcoming Professor Matsota. Thank you, uh, Cosette, it's, uh, for this uh, uh, friendly introduction. Thanks. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for, uh, to be here, have been invited here, and it's a pleasure to see some friends that I have known, whom I have known for quite a while, so uh, uh, it's all swell. Uh, so um, here we go. <clears throat> when Virgil, in his Eclogue 10, wrote, Amor vincit omnia et nos ceramus amori, uh, love conquers all, so let us yield to love. He was summing up the ideological and mythical legacy of Greek and Roman law, Venus, Orpheus, Narcissus, Pyramus and Thisbe, Plato's Symposium, as well as the aura of Rome's political power crystallized in Roma, the reversed, the bustrofedo, a mirrored image of amor, as is known. The power of the sort of love is that of an irresistible tyrant. And as we learn from other texts, friendship may have been a more edifying virtue. But in saying this, Virgil certainly was not pointing in any way toward what became in the Middle Ages and beyond the focus of human existence and of the Christian vision. In the Middle Ages, love is no longer just a philosophical issue, or as it was for those who ascend the um, uh, platonic ladder of being, nor is it the embarrassing passion of a Roman poet like Catullus. It becomes an all-embracing outlook, a spiritual revolution that revealed the essence of individual souls and of the world in the light of God's redemptive love. Nonetheless, Virgil's line caught the inner polarity of love, namely its shadow side covering the paths of numberless enigmatic passions, as well as their counterweight in the dawning day of Christian ethics of love, a force a contradictory tangle of passion and virtue, capable of touching the deepest core of the human personality, of the cosmos and of history. For the Christians, such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, love was to be thought of as a sword that cut, cuts both ways. And at any rate, nothing could be left out of love's expressions. The modern idea of love is neither Greek then nor Roman. It is medieval, 
and it is disseminated by Provencal poets and the Arab forebears. How can we not but think of Petrarch, who, on the one hand, in his canzoniere, makes this love for Laura the seat of all his existential experiences, a sense of self and its moral uh, dramas, while in the Triomphi, the crucial turning point in the trajectory of his love conquers all. The Triomphi turn to the primary data uh, in human experience, from love to death. And the poet wonders which, in the long sequence, is the most omnipotent among them all. Uh, is it love? Chastity? Death? time, fame, or eternity. In his wake, the Renaissance epic by Boyardo, the Orlando Innamorato, to mention the most fragrant case, gives Petrarch's linear sequence of modes of experience, a radical change of perspective, and an expansion of horizon. For Boyardo, love is not an experience that reconnects human beings to the universe, nor is it invested with a numinous power. As we read the poem, the Orlando Innamorato, we enter a maze of betrayals and cunning seductions. Clearly, the Orlando Innamorato is not a romance, a romance. It is an epic, and we witness a panorama of all forms of love, some perverse, as necrophilia, or the idyllic, at the end of the poem, idyllic, playful scene of Fior di Spinas, attraction to Bradamante, um, to Bradamante. But one poet, Dante, presents a conception of love which is not opposed to what went on before his time or after his time. Rather, he subsumed the question of love in a larger and subtler understanding of the complexities of the minds of human beings. And uh, in all his poetic texts, he ponders the question of love. Uh, and uh, uh, his questions are based on two theological principles. One, love is the center of creation. Over and against the so-called Epicureans, or Lucretius sense of the randomness of life, of reality as an endless movement of atoms on the verge of a catastrophic collision, Dante makes love the glue of creation, the bond between creator and creatures, Purgatorio 17. Uh, number two, two theological premises, that's the second now, all human knowledge of the world is determined by the way we choose to love. We understand ourselves and the world by understanding love within us. In other words, as I will try to show this evening, Dante penetrates the veil of the problematical relation between, uh, and adumbrated by, by Virgil too, between amor and omnia. What is the relationship between these two terms? What is omnia? And, we, and amor will try to understand, it's a mystery. And he grasps the problem in a radical and original way because he was steeped in Aristotelian and Platonic philosophies. Aquinas and Augustine, as well as the Provencal poets and the Italian poets as written to style, um, and around the center, the center, he did weave a wide range of issues. The relation between virtues and passions, the mechanism of how love can govern the human mind, its relation to the city of man. Uh, this tangle of idea is what my paper will try to explore, beginning with the Vita Nuova. Um, uh, and we already know uh, also that by the time he wrote the Vitano, he had written the tract on language. And I want to make a reference there, the De Vulgar Eloquentia, uh, that there he states that poetry is the language of the will. This is an important statement. Of course, there is an intellectual love. We can call, we call it philosophy, for instance. But even love, even then, love is rooted in the will. And if so, how is it rooted? Uh, uh, how is it rooted in? Uh, uh, how does it go? Move from uh, the uh, rationality 
uh, to how do we go from the will to the rationality. So uh, let me just start then with uh, the, uh, an exploration of uh, 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 Beatrice and the Accentio Amoris, as Dante calls it, poetry in the Vita Nuova. I'm going to talk about basic texts, poetry, uh, the, the Vita Nuova, Canto V of Inferno, Canto X of Inferno, and a little bit about Picarda. The Vita Nuova tells essentially the story of a double apprenticeship. First of all, a poetic apprenticeship. Dante wants to become a poet, wants to learn to be a poet, and then a sentimental education. And he reflects, Dante goes on reflecting on how each of these two experiences change in the light of the other. The narrative begins by relating the onset of love, or what in the De Vulgari he will call later Accentio Amoris. Love is a fire, Accentio, it's, it's lighted up. In the chance encounter, that's how it begins, in a chance encounter with Beatrice. So love begins there and comes through as an involuntary, sudden experience, which happens to the young protagonist and forces him to think and seek the sense of her, of Beatrice's dazzling apparition. The involuntary event takes us readers and him into two directions. On the one hand, it forces him on a quest. He seeks to understand and interpret the signs of love, to grasp the mystery Beatrice unfolds, and to determine whether the appearance is a fortuitous accident or is meant to reveal a providential design for his life. All the resources of his mind are mobilized by the passion. On the one hand, the movement of the passion engenders in him alterations of the mind, deliriums, hallucinations, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, which haunt him and which he cannot manage to control. They are the signs of love, clinical almost, from the tradition of courtly love. The poetry of the Vita Nuova arises from this double-edged, contradictory nature of his original experience. The first sonnet in this little book, as Dante calls it at the outset, recounts a strange dream. Oh, the protagonist dreams of love. Holding the lover's heart in his hand, wakes the lady from her sleep, and she eats the burning heart. The dream horrifies the young lover, and he writes a sonnet which he sends out to love faithful subjects, i fedeli d'amore, to help him to deci decipher its a disturbing secret truth, in a way, because the protagonist will sink more deeply into his dreams. One can say that however involuntary dreams are, he, will, he wills to dream in that dreams provide him with the freedom of the imagination and permit him to live in the pleasurable depths of idle fictions. In a sense, his first dream poem amounts to the very dream of poetry, but he's an 18-year-old poet. But the dream turns also into food for thought in a specific sense. Passions or dreams, however involuntary, feed his mind and force him, when he awakes, to think and to interpret. And that's the first power of love. It forces us to think. Two poets attempt to draw out the hidden meaning of Dante's initial sonnet. Guido Cavalcanti and the physician Dante Damagliano. Their interpretive reactions complement each other. Guido interprets the sonnet as a sign that love darkens the rigor of the lover's mind and that the passion produces no genuine self-knowledge. If Dante wants to reach a truth about his life, as Guido argues, he has to take the path of philosophy and give up all this nonsense, this nightmarish fantasies of the passion. On the other hand, there is Dante da Maiano, a physician, reads the sonnet as the clinical sign of the lover's deceased minds. For him, love is a sickness in which the stability of reason has been blighted by the imbalance of the humors, and he recommends cold baths as a remedy. Cavalcanti's response marks the beginning of his friendship with Dante, 
who dedicates the Vita Nuova to his first, the first of his friends. By making Guido his privileged correspondent, Dante equates philosophy with the Ciceronian, Aristotelian virtual friendship. What connects the two is that both stand for a voluntary friendship, stands for a voluntary exercise of thought, for a rational, benevolent conversation wherein minds turn together, not at the mercy of somebody else's will or passion, but by making order and reason the laws and sympathy, the laws of organization of the world. De Vita Nuova soon recounts the inadequacy of such a claim, advanced by Guido and provisionally endorsed by Dante. Dante seems to go along with this idea, but no, not for long. Neither Guido Cavalcanti nor Dante da Maiano can sufficiently explain the mystery that Beatrice comes to represent through their diagnosis, philosophical and medical. With their stock notions about philosophy and disease, they reduce love to the abstraction of a willed objective condition and consequently they deprive themselves of the means of understanding the passion of love. And if one poet makes love an evil of the dimmed mind, the other cast is a question for the physics of bodies. Take a cold bath, so you'll feel better. To the pair of philosophy and friendship, or let's say medicine and love, Dante substitutes another pair, love and poetry. He thinks that love is better than friendship because in its violent and obscure occurrence, it forces truths about oneself that rational thinking cannot ever engender. And because these truths are involuntary, they bear the mark of necessity. To understand this new idea of love for Beatrice, Dante undertakes the apprenticeship of art. To this end, he reviews, utilizes, and absorbs all available poetic conventions of love, classical personifications of love, the rhetoric of Provencal poetry, uh, culturally love conventions, and the sweet new style of Winizelli. In order to write about her, about Beatrice, he envelops himself in the language of others and draws his craft from the resources available in the poetic tradition. Such an apprenticeship becomes a preamble to a further quest. He looks for a unique language, one that is his own and adequately corresponds to the unique reality of Beatrice. His search for a new style deeply alters his earlier understanding of love. Because his love appears as the pursuit for, of a definite figure, Beatrice, poetic language cannot just play freely in an involuntary, drifting proliferation of words. You're talking about a, a, a real person. He must rethink, therefore, and turn the, to the will, impart a direction to it, and walk away from the wrong and the play acting of empty simulacra. As he says, love appears with warning words. Uh, love warning sounds clear. Uh, my son, it's time to do away with false ideals. Musa's translation, Tempus uh, uh, Simulacra Nostra. To say that he now wills the real is tantamount to rejecting the assumption that Beatrice is merely imaginary and to acknowledge that her reality is deeper than his initial wondrous dreams about her. Her reality, however, is put into question by her death, sudden death. Her death provisionally entails a loss of belief in the future and in the substantiality of the real world. How real can one be who is not seen, who is not visible, who is absent? The text gives ample evidence that this shift in problems also invests Dante's poetry. At the beginning, but because he's haunted by this passion, and even later, phrases come to him as if he were an empty vessel or an inspired poet. He records them. He sees what he calls a desire to write a poem, volontà di dire, and decides to gain control of his words. Such a shift occurs with the poem, Donne che avete intelletto d'amore, ladies who have intelligence of love, which is introduced by his reflection, this reflection. Then it happened that while walking down a pathway along which ran a very clear stream, the Arno River, not as high as we saw in the pictures of the uh, earlier lecture, I suddenly felt a great desire to write a poem, and I began to think how I would go about it, chapter 19. 
significantly against this dissolution proposed by Cavalcanti's sundering of love and philosophy, Dante's song bears witness to his new thought. Love and intellect are yoked together. That's the first insight. I have. It's the will, but it's also it's the intellect, this part of it. It's inseparable from the will. And, cha and chapter 26, which is addressed to Guido, makes clear he himself now regains both his will and his freedom. He can choose to reject the poem. He can choose the world of prose or the appropriate language to address, of address to Beatrice. And he can choose his audience in the conviction that in poetry, the voluntary and the involuntary, the inspired and the willed, necessarily converge. In short, his poems enact a newly found freedom, for to be free entails the possibility of beginning again and again, and the virtue of thought. Such a virtue is the theme of what he calls the directio voluntatis, the direction of the will, which we formulate in the De Vulgare Eloquentia, where he also, it's rectitudo, uh, uh, or justice, a form of justice. One can add the two words directio and rectitudo, etymologically they are the same. In substantive terms, directio implies that the will by itself alone cannot rule itself and needs reasons, governments. Yet in the Vita Nuova, where the will turns out to be sovereign and preferable to unwilling or daydreaming, Dante stumbles on the limitations and even powerlessness of the will. It is as if the initial insight into the importance of involuntary experience were ratified. Beatrice dies, his will can do nothing about it, her depth plunges him into a state of dejection and it triggers an ethical drama quite common in medieval lyrics, the betrayal of the beloved. That's most poetry of the Middle Ages, we'll talk about it, about this experience. Dante betrays Beatrice's memory by turning to another woman. He yields to the temptation of believing she is not unique and she's not irreplaceable. But the outcome of the story is the resolution to see her again. Consistently, the Vita Nova ends with a project of the future. I hope to write of her that which has never been written of any other woman. And that's the conclusion of the text. The ending of the Vita Nova dumbrates the writing of the Divine Comedy. Uh, and let me say that in the dedication uh, letter to Can Grande, uh, Dante goes on uh, talking about uh, uh, assigns the divine comedy to the rubric of free will. It says, the subject of the whole work then taken literally is the state of souls after death, understood without qualifications, for the movement of the whole work turns out upon this and about it, this. Uh, if, on the other hand, the work is taken allegorically, the subject is man in the exercise of his free choice, meriting or demeriting the rewards or punishment of justice. So there is clearly a continuity, even in the perception of uh, uh, this understanding of the importance of the free will. The letter, uh, of course, does not engage, uh, uh, nor could it try to establish the meaning of free will. What does he mean by that, a free choice? Whether the human act of choice in the will is determined by reason, or whether free will means that freedom is the fundamental character of the will. Uh, to be sure, liberum arbitrium, the faculty of reason and will, is a crown and a mitre attained by the pilgrim in the garden of, uh, of Eden. Man's sovereignty lies then in the possession of such a freedom, although freedom is much more than a possession. It coincides with man's very being. At any rate, the act of choice establishes justice as the divine government of man, which demands man to do good and not to and harm no one. Let, let me put aside the, the Vita Nova. I have exhausted what I had to say about this topic and turn to Canto V. Canto V of Inferno, which we all know is the Canto of Lovers, Francesca above all. Canto V of Inferno dramatizes the dangers and complexities of the belief in the sovereignty of the will. This is the canto where lust is punished, and the sinners who have invested the order of reason over the will, uh, i peccator carnali, che la ragion sommettono al talento, go endlessly round in circles, returning to the starting point. They never rest, and thus they enact the existence as pure desire. Uh, or to put it in Augustinian language, they dramatize the restlessness of the heart forever, 
out of place. Among the sinners from the classical and medieval world, there are queens such as Dido, Cleopatra, Semiramis, as well as Paris, Tristan and Achilles, and Dante singles out two contemporary souls, Paolo and Francesca. He calls them uh, as doves called by desire with wings raised and steady come through the air, borne by their will to the sweet nest, so did this issue from the troop where Dido uh, is coming to us. The image of the dove with which he describes them, the bird that in classical lore is said to be sacred to Venus, to describe the two human beings discloses the essence of desire as, a common, as common to both animals and human behavior. In the natural world of Paolo and Francesca, the platonic wings of desire are to be understood as the natural appetite, as a tendency to move toward a place where the need is satisfied. By contrast, will indicates a rational, deliberate desire that characterizes a choice. As Francesca summarizes her love experience to the pilgrim, she gives us evidence of her choice. Her speech centers on love. She says, love, uh, which is quickly kindled in the gentle heart, sees this one for the fair form that was taken from me and the way of it afflicts me still. Love, which absolves no loved one from loving, seized me so strongly with delight in him that, as you see, it does not, it does not leave me even now. Love brought, to, uh, brought us to one death. Caina awaits him who quenched our life. Through these three tercets, as I'm reading in English, three tercets, as Natalino Sapegno years ago pointed out, the grammatical subject is a personified love. Love made me do this. Love is, uh, is what you cannot resist, etc. So she, who dwells among queens and acknowledges God as a king, she refers to God as a king, Francesca, casts herself as a subject of victim, enthralled by the overpowering God of love. Further, as Renato Poggioli, died in 64, has shown, Francesca's speech revolves around the question of desire mediated by literature. She discovers, for instance, that she fell in love while reading the medieval romance of Lancelot and Guinevere. Finally, her reference to love turns out to be quotations of love formulated, formulas available in texts ranging from Andrea Scapellanos to Dante's Milizelli, al cor gentil, Le para sempre amore. And Dante's own also vita nuova, amore cor gentis solo una cosa. These literary formulas, while thematically they flatter the sense of the spontaneity of Francesca's passion, show that she is possessed by literature and that her mind mirrors the love, uh, the, 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 the love of uh, the love sky of Lancelot and Guinevere that she's reading about. When the romance they read tells them of this kiss between the fictional lovers, the two, Paolo and Francesca, really decide to read no further and imitate the two fictional figures' kiss. Paradoxically, when Francesca thinks she's spontaneous and free, she is in the bondage to fiction. When she thinks she's enthralled to love, she hides her moral choice. By the paradox, Dante goes to the roots of the passion and uncovers the self-delusion in Francesca's exercise of pure will. Francesca, who lives under the sovereignty of the will, reduces her life into an imaginary life. She yields to a world of phantoms, to the magic enchantment of reading, whereby she wills, she wills herself and her lover as respectively Guinevere and Lancelot. And in the process, she derealizes her existence. She plunges into a fantasy world where she can only play forever at being a queen and can live forever and can live forever and can live forever in a, the utopian condition of permanent desire, which is the reason why she goes on imagining this love. Although her voluntarism comes through as an aesthetic posture and manifests her narcissism, in that her self-absorption expects no practical results and ends in death, Francesca's frame of references evokes the ethics of courtly love. From her exchange with Dante, we infer that she approves of and wants his approval for her choice of an ethics of gentle hearts, heroic passions, and instant pleasures. 
Yet the point is not simply that she substitutes one ethics for another. One may suspect that she actually attempts to do away with all ethics. She destroys within herself the bonds of time, family, and reality, so that her kingdom of sheer fantasy may come into existence. She wills a glamorous aesthetic life, and because her will dictates action, and in this sense has the power of command, she ends up living eternally in, as a literary figure. In effect, even her claims of love, an experience which inherently belongs to a mode of temporal anticipation or memory, are forfeited by her thrust toward an imaginary eternity. There is one figure who is opposed and clarifies the limitations of Francesca, and it's Picard, who believes in the inviolability of the will. Let me just, this will be a very brief uh, digression. Francesca's blind surrender to her passion, her incapacity to control her will, the phenomenon of her will to will, finds the, the, its illumination and corrective counterpart in the symmetrically corresponding Canto of Paradise, Canto V. In the heaven of the moon, Dante encounters Picard, a nun, who is forced to break her vow by the political machinations of her brother, Corso Donati, and to Mary. But her will was not broken by her brother's frenzy and sacrilege. This means that her, her action cannot be equated either with the, dictation, the dictates of her will or the guidance of her intellect. Beatrice justifies Picarda's place in the lowest order of beatitude by claiming the autonomy of her will. No outside power can encroach upon or destroy its operations or essential freedom. Following Aristotle, ethics, who touches several times on two sorts, on the two sorts of will, Beatrice distinguishes between the absolute and the conditional will of souls, between constrained activity and involuntary action. Her argument rests on the motive that Picarda's absolute will remained faithful to her life in the convent, even if her conditional will yielded to coercion. She surrenders to contingent and provisional circumstances without consenting to them. In Paradiso V, Beatrice shows how Picarda's vow made her escape all constraints and act as a free agent. Anyway, what is a vow? The word vow derives uh, from the word for will, voluntas. Therefore, a vow, this is Aquinas, consists only in an act of the will. This etymology, vow in the velle, etymology sustains the logical unfolding of the cant. In Beatrice's exposition, God bestows the greatest gift to human beings, and the gift is the la volontate, la libertà, the, the freedom of the will, the faculty of will and judgment, which is the stamp of rationality angels and men alike share. Within the framework of God's liberality, the vow signals the restitution of the gift, which comes through as the sacrifice of the free will. From the standpoint, Picarda's moral drama yielding to her brother's coercion and willpower is secondary to the initial choice she made. In point of fact, she affirms the value and supremacy of the transcendent or the order of contingency. Uh, the move shows Dante's chief purpose. He sets up a moral problem so that he can point out how it can be overcome by removing self-possession and freeing oneself from the chains of aestheticism. Francesca, to give consistency to her act, the acts of her will, sacrifices the world and chooses to escape into the realm of fantasy. That's what I call aestheticism. Picarda divests herself of her free will, and when she's forced back into the realities of the world by somebody else's will, she can only pursue the good. Let me go now to the basic point of the political dimension of separating love and intellect, will and intellect. I turn to the canto of uh, Canto 10 of Inferno. The aesthetic, brief resume, the aesthetic and ethical voluntarism I have been describing is not just a subjective issue, nor does it concern only Francesca, Picarda, or Dante. It is, there is also a political voluntarism. And it uh, edges this political voluntarism, Francesca's experience, surrounded she is by queens, legislators, and founders of city. Dante, from the, who from this angle is an Augustinian, tests the relation between politics and the will extensively. 
He does so poignantly in Inferno 10, where the sinners, on the face of it, they create questions of the immortality of the soul with the course of human history. They dissolve, this is the Canto 10, eternity into time. There is no such a thing as eternity to them, the immortality of the soul, and show themselves as finite, time-bound beings. They live entirely, though, within the horizon of history and of their city, the seat of hell, is made plain by the fact that the sinners here inquire with a transparent symmetrical precision about ancestors, about fatherland, about the fate of their own children. They belong to the world of immanence. The city and the soul, politics and philosophy are the two categories organizing the unfolding of this canto in the platonic persuasion that the city is the soul writ large. But they don't believe in the soul, so the city just is. They have no principle of organization. I would like to probe the vagaries of intellect and will, the passions of the soul, and the destructive distortions of the city. On the face of it, the will has little to do with sinners. Fate. The pilgrim has just entered. This is the context of the action, for those of you who don't remember. The pilgrim has just entered the city of this, where heresy, a word that means to choose, is punished. Here are philosophers, among whom there is Epicurus and the Emperor Frederick II. And they are punished for not believing in the immortality of the soul. The choice of unbelief is rooted in intellectual judgment. From the point of view, why should it be a sin? You need the will to make a sin, the will. Given the intellectual nature of the choice, W.H. Reed wondered whether heresy should be considered a sin at all, since it is known a sin must involve the will. At any rate, Inferno 10 gets started by the traditional juxtaposition of Athens to Jerusalem, the city of philosophy to the city of revelation, which is evoked by the reference to the valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, where the resurrection of the souls will take place at the end of time. Once inside the walls of the infernal city, Dante meets two Florentines, Farinata and Cavalcanti, and through them he confronts Florence's persistent civil war between Welfs and Ghibellines, as well as his own past in his city. Farinata appears erect from the waist up in a tomb. His punishment fits the crime. He does not believe in the immortality of the soul, thus, quite fittingly, he lives an eternal death. Yet he acts contemptuously toward the dead, and for that matter, toward the living, as if he actually did stand above all. He is the one to inquire about Dante's ancestors, whom he acknowledges as enemies he had twice defeated. Chi for li maggior tui? Who were your ancestors? The word translates the Latin maiores, the greater, the, the, the uh, elders. And the questions about lineage reveal a number of facts about Farinata. For him, the foundations of the present and the source of his authority lies in the past. The belief in the authority of the past betrays his sense of mortality. More than that, he believes that power, like authority, has its roots in the past. Dante is equal to the challenge. With equal pride, he responds that though driven twice out of the city, twice his own ancestors returned to Florence. Violence, which is power run amok, plays the role of authority. And as such, it makes all spiritual authority vanish. The political squabble engaging, engaging the wealth Dante and the Ghibelline Farinata is interrupted by Cavalcanti's Cavalcanti, widow's father, who inquires about the fate of her son. And he says, if you go through this blind prison <clears throat> by height of genius, where is my son? And why is he not with thee? And I answered him, I come not of myself. He that waits yonder is leading me through here, perhaps to her, young, your widow held in disdain. His words and the nature of his punishment had already told me his name, so that I replied this fully. Suddenly, he said, how did he? Did you say he had? Does he not still live? Does he not, does not the sweet light not, not strike his eyes? And when he perceived that I made some delay in answering, he fell back again and showed himself no more. But the other, the great soul of whom, in, uh, at whose instance I had stopped, changed not his aspect, nor moved his neck, nor bent his side. And if, he said, continuing his discourse, they have ill learned that art, etc., etc., they came back, etc. We over here, in the interruption of Guido Cavalcanti, uh, this discourse of 
Farinata and Dante, the vibrations of the city's conversation. Salvation for the old father, who clearly has his own philosophical pretensions, is completely accept, accept, accessible to and compatible with human intelligence. The phrase height of success, he uses, an allusion to the San Guido's intellectual excellence, harkens back to Farinata's magnanimity. The etymology of the word is bound to sound ironic in this place where the soul is defeated. And it shows Cavalcanti's mistaken belief that Dante's journey is a philosophical or intellectual journey. It's not. But the phrase Dante also stages his friend Guido's spiritual death as well as the reasons for it. As has been acknowledged, the speech features echoes of the rhyme scheme Guido's love poem, Donna me prega, a woman begs me. The, the one who has written about this uh, is John Fritschero, very beautifully. The poem was conceived as, as the answer to the queries by Donna me prega, a lady begs me, by a fictional woman about the nature, place, and effects of love. Guido casts love is an experience that descends from the darkness of Mars, the sphere of the irascible, and dwells, he says, in quella parte dove sta memoria, in that part of the mind where memory is, uh, in the sensitive faculty of the soul. Practically following Isidoro Seville's etymology, uh, it comes, death comes from Mars, Amarte Mors. Cavalcanti describes love as a war, the activity of Mars that ends in death. Uh, in Inferno 10, where the primary thematic focus of the narrative is the civil war, this theory of love as a destructive passion underlies the reality of the civil war, just as the civil war crystallizes the essence of this love. The reason for the destructiveness of this love depends on Guido's assumption of the radical heterogeneity between love and intellect. In Donna Me Pre, in the poem he writes, a lady begs me who wants to know what is love and asks him about it. Love is an unrelenting passion that robs the self of any rationality and never becomes itself a rational activity. In the Vita Nuova, as I argued a little earlier, Dante falls briefly into, this, into the enchanted poetic philosophical circle of Guido Cavalcanti. But in Inferno 10, Dante understands that bodies without souls are nothing, or they are like corpses of the dead woman, Beatrice's friend, whose funeral, by the way, he describes, he attends in, in, in uh, the Vita Nuova. And although Guido has advised, a, has advised a life of rational pursuit and harsh, and had dismissed love's dark passion, Dante now intuits that Guido's theory of love is the real, though unacknowledged, source of Farinata's politics, and vice versa. His idea of Eros, Farinata's idea of Eros, Eros, much like that of the other views of politics, leads to a division within the soul, as well as the tyranny of partisans' politics. Let me now go and read into the Epicurean, I call it fractured society, subjective wills and fractured society. Dante's exchange with Farinata and Cavalcanti highlights his notion of political Epicureanism and exposes the weakness and incoherence of that intellectual system. The commonplaces of the medieval mythography of Epicurus are available through a series of texts well known to Dante. Isidore of Seville defines Epicurus as the philosopher who loved vanity, not wisdom, one who denies the world's government by providence and who believes in the corporeal nature of bodies. John of Salisbury attributes to Epicurus both the belief in the world's origins from atoms and the disbelief in God as the author of the world. A fuller treatment of Epicurean politics, ethics, psychology, and physics is found in Cicero's De Finibus. And there, Cicero levels three major objections to Epicurus, natural philosophy, ethics, and politics. He admits that Epicurus' doctrines resemble Democritus. One. At the heart of his theory stand their physics, and they believe, he says, in certain things, this is I'm translating from Cicero, which they term atoms existing from all eternity, though indivisible they are composed of parts. The motion of these atoms is such that they collide and cohere together. So at the stake of this vision, the Epicurean vision, is an atomic theory which underlies Epicurean's materialism, materialistic theory of the mortality of the soul. 
Torquatus, who is Cicero's character in the Finibus, objects to Epicurus on grounds that he places the criteria of reality into in sensations. Further, Cicero discounts the Epicurean theory of ethical hedonism, the belief in the feelings of pleasure and pain lie at the root of every act of choice. Because if pleasure is the end of life, then politics, which is the arena of dangerous competition, is an impossible activity. You cannot do politics if really the aim of life is pleasure. A contradiction thwarts the relation between the, this philosophy and the life of the city. Epicurus retreats into himself and to his garden in the company of his friends. He escapes history in the sense that he shows no interest in public life and chooses intellectual contemplation over action. Nor is there room in such a context for justice as either a transcendent norm or as a political virtue. Finally, Cicero reflects on the apparent contradiction between the Epicurean theory of pleasure and the ideal of friendship, which, which the Epicureans hold in high esteem, but which seem to be dismantled by the pleasure-centered ethos. The, the point is, if I am interested in pleasure, it's always going to be my pleasure. Uh, the, uh, the philosophers who have retreated from the world witness the breakdown of the city. These contradictions transposed to the domain of politics color Canto 10 of Dante's Inferno. It is Dante's irony, thus, to mix together Epicurus, the philosopher who retreats into absolute eternal order of the mind, with Farinata and Cavalcanti, who dwell in the domain of historical contingency and mortality. All of them live apart from others, whether out of philosophical conviction or political sense of belonging to a special class and not as part of a unified all. But there are other sources of contradictions. Farinata recognizes Dante from the Tuscan cadence of his language. O Tosco, che per la città del fuoco di quella nobile patria vivo ten vai, col tuo parlare onesto, di quella nobile patria natia, alla quale forse fui troppo molesto. O Tuscan, who was alive to the city of fire, a native of that fatherland to which I perhaps did too much harm. There's a subtle distinction in our work between città and patria, fatherland and city. Città designates a city, whereas patria means fatherland or country. In a canto such as this, where fathers worry about sons and ancestors cast a long shadow on their descendants, the term refers to one's place of origin or the particular place of one's family. Patria, in this sense, antedates città which ever since Aristotle's politics aims at the highest and comprehensive good. Ironically, this città is hell. The irony reaches even further. Both Farinata and Dante live in a world of unrelated parts, of atomized, fragmented entities that caricature Epicurean doctrine. Dante's ancestors, Farinata says, were adverse to his party, alla mia parte. Parte designates also the quarters where the factions were scattered. By the end of the canto, the old Gavalcante, who inquires about the present, but knows the past and the future, divides time into unknowable parts. In effect, and the irony is devastating for these political philosophers, his partial knowledge is no knowledge at all. The incomplete knowledge of time in its present form forfeits the possibility both of a comprehensive whole and the completion of history. More to the point, the word parte figures in the opening lines of Cavalcanti's Torno Me Prega and Dante's Vita Nuova. Dante begins in quella parte dove sta memoria, in that part where memory is found, is deliberately echoed by Dante, in quella parte dove sta memoria is Guido, and deliberately echoed by Dante's opening words in quella parte del libro della mia memoria, and so on. How do we understand this idea, this acknowledgement of parts? The two poets, who once were friends, deeply differ on how parts are related to wholes and on how bodies are related to souls. The importance of this issue for Dante emerges from Monarchia 1.6, where in the general context of an Augustinian order of love, he muses on the logical connection between partial order and total order. Within that political frame of references, the part is related to the whole as its end. The tenet echoes the argument of the relation between parts and whole developed both in Aristotle's physics and in Aquinas' commentary on it. In the political Epicureanism, Farinata crystallizes the whole has crumbled into broken parts, 
in Nada Farinata, no Cavalcanti see the, see the way of fitting the priests into a unified totality. A sharp image of the city emerges from these uncivil conversations. It is enveloped in anarchy and chaos. The canto is marked by quarrels, misunderstandings about what exactly phrases mean, interruptions, confusions of the public with the private. Farinata, for instance, looks at life and death from the point of view of the good of the city, but he lets his partisan concerns obscure his sense of the city. Cavalcanti, on the other hand, thinks only of his son's fate, and the indifference of Farinata to Cavalcanti's grief captures the reality of the city under the sway of discord, with each element believing the compelling superior nature of his own, its own concerns. The mixture of political relations and personal attachments belies the Epicurean principle of self-sufficiency. What these characters convey is the desire to impose the subjective wills onto the chaos of the city. Above all, the scene makes visible the working of the will behind the claims of an apparent pure rationality. Heres is not merely an intellectual choice. For all his magnanimity and for all the appearance that he, like a soulless being, neither moves nor is he moved by the grief of others, Farinata is ruled by passions and by the will to crush his enemies. Between him and Dante, there is a struggle for recognition, the desire for mastery over the sub submissive enemy, which makes Farinata's magnanimity edge toward pride and disguises the hidden will to affirm his own values. By the same token, the old Cavalcanti yields to pathos over the feared premature death of his son. Finally, the tragic view of politics in the canto as a conflict without solution shows to Dante himself the ambiguities of the political project delineated in his Monarchia. On the one hand, Monarchia uh, evokes the reconstituted political society in the light of rational philosophy, a philosophy that is mistakenly struck some as a veroistic. On the other hand, Dante takes the history of Rome, which St. Augustine views as the history of the will to power, or libido dominandi, as the paradigm of political excellence. In the wake of Augustine, he sees uh, the empire as both rooted in human sinfulness, but also as a remedy to sin. So let me just conclude. Francesca is the estate who wills to transform the world, her world into an act of the imagination and the projection of her daydreams. Farinata Cavalcanti are the philosophers, politicians, the political philosophers who stand for the will to power and conceal from themselves the workings of the will, only to discover that reason alone dooms them to live in isolation, for this sort of reason cannot be construed as a bridge between self and others. Dante returns to the disguises and crises of the will in Inferno 11, where he explicitly contrasts the system of Epicurean politics and politics, Epicurean ethics and politics, by giving an exposition of the character of human life in terms of Aristotle's ethics and physics, and a quietest commentary on it. And then I will end with this. The moral framework of Inferno, with tripartite structures, the sense of incontinence, bestiality, and fraud, is patterned, so we have been told, and that's the way it is, on the blueprint of the ethics. In listing the order of sins, Virgil makes no mention of some of moral violations, such as heresy, usury, and so on. And that asks Virgil to explain the sin of usury. And he complies by sketching the outline of an aesthetic theory in which usury, because it is an unreal, illusory production, comes forth as a caricature of art and there's a cult of sh shams that mocks the productive books of nature. He writes, philosophy, for one who understands it, he said to me, points out, not in one place alone, how nature takes a course from the divine mind and its heart. And if thou note well thy physics, you will find not many pages on that, y that your art, as far as it can, follows nature as the pupil the master, so that your art is to God as it were a grandchild. But this too, if you recall to mind Genesis, near the beginning, it behooves mankind to gain their livelihood and, uh, and their advancement. And because the usurer takes another way, he despises nature. Aristotle's physics, which debates the relationship between parts and wholes, and whether or not the soul moves the body, 
argues for a view of parts that correlate with each other. Dante's view of art as a virtue of making, of its filial relationship to the productive order of nature, and of its discipline and educational role derives from the physics, but it finds its adequate gloss in the theoretical framework of Aquinas' proemium in his, in, his, to his, in his commentary on the politics. He writes, as the philosopher teaches in book two of the physics, art imitates nature. Now, the principle of these things that comes about through art is the human intellect, and the human intellect derives according to a certain resemblance from the divine intellect, which is the principle of natural things. Hence, the operations of art must imitate the operations of nature. For if an instructor of some art were to produce a work of art, the disciple who receives his art from him would have to observe that word so that he himself might act in, might act in like manner. The astonishing parallel between the two passages, which I think, don't think is very well known, forces us to say that for Dante, just as for Aquinas, art that he writes is not a form of theoretical knowledge. It is connected, connected to a sentimental education of human beings, as the Vita Lua had already understood. It fulfills the real ends of the natural world and is akin to prudence. More overtly than St. Thomas, for whom art plays a ministerial function, Dante views art as the activity bringing us back to the ground of nature, to the consideration of principles, beginnings, and foundations. A metaphysics of desire, and not just a political project underlies this paradigm of art. This conflation of Aristotle's physics and Genesis evokes both nature's beginnings and the primal conditions of men's fall, where work is both a punishment and a remedy. Art for Dante, the art he writes, is a labor of love, whereby human beings find their bearing in the world, shape nature to their purposes, and begin anew in an effort to change the wilderness in paradise and discover the possibility of ending up in the embrace of a loving God. Thank you.